All right. Thank you to everyone for joining. I'm Shannon Merchant. I'm the Director of Career Development at the Evans School here at the University of Washington. Um, we are really happy to be offering this event um, along with our colleagues, colleagues in the GC office here at the University of Washington, which I believe stands for Graduate Student Excellence. Equity, equity Equ and Excellence. Equity and Excellence, formerly known as GoMap, um, but we're so happy to be doing this in collaboration with GC um, and to be hosting the Government Accountability Office. And here at the Evans School, we like to begin all of our programs and center it with a brief acknowledgement. Um, I am here in Seattle, which is the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people. And at the University of Washington, we work on the lands of the Coast Salish people, um, including lands touching the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Puyallup, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Um, today, we are gonna be hearing from a federal government agency, and we're gonna be learning more about public service careers, public impact careers, um, and it is so important to think about and acknowledge and understand the history um, of this country, how that has played out in systems of inequity um, that are built into many of our government systems and agencies. And so as you are thinking about what does a career in public service look like, we would really encourage you to ask these questions um, about history, history of place, um, history of people, um, and look at what are some of the systems that are being upheld that we can challenge, we can push back on, and we can really think about our role as leaders, as analysts, researchers, policymakers um, in that space. And so we are Really happy to have such strong representation from across the Government Accountability Office. And with that, I will go ahead and hand things over to that staff. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Wallace. Thank you for joining us today. I work in the Government Accountability Office, GAO office here in Seattle, though I'm um, just about a mile and a half from University of Washington campus at the moment here in my in my home office. Uh, first off, I really wanted to thank you, Shannon, as well as Carolyn Jackson from GC in helping uh, pull this event together. Uh, GAO has a long standing and very successful uh, partnership with the University of Washington in terms of um, a recruiting pipeline and a number of analysts and interns um, are all UW and Evans School alumni. So uh, some of those colleagues of mine are here with me today to talk to you. Um, and I also uh, am an alumni. I graduated uh, with a concurrent degree program in 2006, concurrent Jackson School and Evans School master's degrees. So um, I've long been interested and involved in sort of maintaining the relationship from a recruiting perspective. But it has been a while since we've had a chance to have a sort of broad information session. So just wanted to have a chance to connect with you all um, now that we're in this sort of new normal-ish uh, virtual environment and share a little bit about the work we do at GAO, the types of opportunities that are sort of available on a rolling basis to graduate students and recent, gra um, recent grads, as well as to sort of share with you again, uh, with my colleagues here, just some perspectives on how GAO has been adapting and changing uh, during the pandemic work environment, the ways in which uh, our agency, both internally and externally, and the work we do has really um, put a, a new focus or a renewed emphasis on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. So that's kind of a, an overview of what we're here to talk about today. Just at the highest level, uh, GAO is an independent nonpartisan agency and our core mission is really to advise Congress about ways in which the federal government can be made more efficient, effective, ethical, equitable, and responsive. Um, 
there's a couple of handouts I had sent to Shannon ahead of time uh, that she can share with you. We just want to keep this kind of conversational and free flowing. So I'll, I'll reference a couple, of those, a couple of those, but certainly to the extent you've got time and interest down the road, uh, feel free to look through those. They've got a lot of additional details on the nature of the work we do, our organizational structure, as well as um, general information related to careers in the federal government and the application process itself. So those are certainly resources for you down the road. Uh, and now I would like to pass it over to Sharon Silas, who is our um, executive for the University of Washington. She also is a University of Washington alumni. She's got a tremendous amount of experience both in our Seattle field office and in Washington, DC. And she's currently a director in our healthcare team. So um, pass it over to you, Sharon. Maria. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to be here today. As Maria mentioned, I am an alumni from the Evans School. I graduated in 2000, which is like, makes me sound incredibly old. <laughs> like a million years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I interned at GAO while I was at the Evans School, which is a, a good way to kind of um, get, check out GAO, see if it's a good fit for you. And we can, you know, see if it's a good fit for us. Um, and then I ended up coming back as a full-time employee um, in 2000 after I graduated. And so, been at GAO for 20 years now. Um, I recently became a director, um, so a senior executive about four years ago. Um, and prior to that, I spent most of my GAO career in the Seattle field office and working in our physical infrastructure team, um, which is primarily focused on transportation issues, but we also do work in kind of like post office and looking at uh, federal properties. Um, I really focused on the transportation area and I spent a good amount of time focused on freight commerce issues and looking at maritime policy and trucking and, and rail. So one of the things that I wanted to let everybody know is that um, I consider myself a generalist. And so I did not have this one, even a massive interest in transportation or, um, you know, like did not really think that that was like an area that I wanted to pursue. But one of the really awesome things about GAO is that if you like research, if you like learning new topics, um, it's a great place to uh, have a career. And I really considered myself a generalist. And so I had an opportunity to start out in the physical infrastructure team and work on a whole range of of topics. Um, and then, you know, about five years ago, um, I was assistant director in the physical infrastructure team. I had kind of made my way up. Um, I decided that I wanted to have some experience out in DC um, and work at a headquarters. My son had just graduated from college and I was like, okay, I'm free. I'm going to go do something new, switch things up. And so I did a short-term telework um, uh, agreement to go out for six months out in DC, which is one of the awesome things about GAO. There's like lots of flexibility to try to work from different offices. Um, and then, you know, now in this telework environment, everybody's working from home anyways. But um, I did go out to DC for six months. I loved it. Um, it was uh, kind of like a good reset and kind of re-energized me about with my career, which is another thing that you can you'll find at GAO, um, people always say they're gonna come to GAO and stay three to five years. I was one of those people. I've been here 20 years and there's lots of great reasons for that in terms of like just keeping things fresh and opportunities to work within the agency and kind of change up your position and your role there. So, um, so anyways, I was out in DC, I loved it. Uh, the headquarters experience was different from the field office. Um, I was really energized. And so I decided to move out there permanently. And then I um, applied for the senior executive program, which is a program that gets you to the, your senior executive level as a director. Um, and um, I applied, I was accepted to that program. They, uh, it's like a year and a half to two years in that program, then you graduate and you become a director. And so I did that. And one of the things that um, they do as part of that 
program and something similar to what some of the folks on the panel will be talking about today is our professional development program where you rotate through different teams. Similarly, in the senior executive program, uh, you rotate it to a different team. And so I was placed in the healthcare team. Um, and so, and that's where I ended up permanent placing as a director. So I lead um, all of our work on veterans and military healthcare. And um, I also do uh, some public health work, which Corrine knows about. I'm working with her right now on a public health job. Um, and um, I'll just say a couple of things of like, you know, what I love about GAO, which kind of hits on some of the things that Maria wanted me to talk about, which is our mission. Um, you know, as Maria mentioned, we do work for Congress. And um, our work is driven by either requests from committees or by mandate, so through law. And um, when we conduct our work and produce a product or a report or a hearing or a testimony, um, it's directed to um, congressional committees or to Congress themselves. And um, we basically cover every topic manageable, imaginable um, around where a federal dollar could be traveling. So if the federal government's spending money on it or is directing any kind of programs, GAO is going to look at it. So when I talk about like my experience in physical infrastructure and also in the healthcare team, I mean, we was just looking at just a gamut of programs and policies um, related to those issues. But we also do, you know, homeland security, defense. Uh, international work, um, you know, financial markets. So just pretty much any area that the federal government is involved in, we conduct work in and we have teams set up to do that. Um, and for me, one of the things that's awesome because I do get bored is that you can work on all these different topics and the projects change every year and the people you work with change every year. So it keeps it really fresh and it kind of gets back to the point that I was making about um, why people end up staying at GAO for 20 years, which seems very old school to me, right? It's kind of like how people used to work, right? Nowadays, you see people changing jobs quite often. And so, um, but this is a place where you can change up your role and responsibilities um, within the same agency without, you know, having to leave. Um, the other thing that I love about GAO is our core values. And as Maria mentioned, we are independent, nonpartisan objective. And you know, in the kind of highly politicized environment we've been in in the last few years, um, it's so important to have an agency like this. And, um, and you can really see the value of it with Congress. And, you know, people, especially nowadays through the media, like people can put out all kinds of information with their spin on it. But at GAO, we are respected for being nonpartisan and independent. And so when we put something out, people know it's quality work and that there is no spin on it. And um, I feel so proud to be part of an organization right now that's able to do that because there's not a lot of us out there nowadays. Um, and then the other last piece that I love about GAO is our people values. Our work is done in teams. It's done by building consensus. Um, our products, our institutional products. So there's a lot of like working with lots of people with different stakeholders, methodologists, lawyers, the analysts. And so having kind of a respect and a support for the people that you're working with is very important to GAO. And I know that a lot of different organizations and agencies are putting a lot of emphasis on like uh, DE and I and kind of you know different communication styles and as I've GAO has actually been doing this for a very long time because we hire lots of really smart qualified people but I have seen where you not getting along or respecting the people that you're working with or being able to communicate with them has completely derailed teams and their products and GAO has always known this so they've always really emphasized this and so even more so in the last few years, there's been more steps taken to kind of make sure that we are emphasizing those people values, emphasizing the diversity of the opinions that, are, that come onto teams to help us guide the work that we do. Um, and I, you know, I can speak directly for the healthcare team. One of the things that we've done is we've developed a de &I tool and all the teams are starting to do this where there is a very specific um, directed look at the work that we're doing for Congress and looking at how DEI fits into it. 
So it's something that we're considering, like we're looking at legal issues. That's something that we're considering as part of, you know, like different methodologies that would be best. We're taking like a, making a concerted effort to look at like, are there like angles around disparities or DEI that we need to include in this review and uh, to let our clients know, Congress, that we're going to be including it as part of this review and have it be part of our product. Um, so I'll stop there. I know I've been talking a long time. I feel like Maria's giving me the evil eye, but um, uh, I covered and I covered a lot. So I'm glad to take any questions, but just wanted to like give you a little bit of my background and kind of some of the things that I really love about GAO and kind of why I'm still here after 20 years. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Sharon. And Sharon really highlighted um, a lot of key things about our organization. As she said, you know, pretty much anything that federal dollars are spent on, we will look at. And, you know, we have 15 different mission teams, some of the ones she mentioned that are sort of broken out by issue area, uh, looking at those topics. We also have field offices located throughout the country. Uh, there's 11 field offices, I think about two thirds of the staff are in DC and headquarters. And certainly we've all been virtual for um, well over a year and a half now. Um, but in theory, we've got these different locations and we sort of work across locations. It doesn't matter really where you are um, for the given topic uh, and it may or may not involve again, pre-pandemic times involve travel and site visits to sort of looking at um, how federal grant programs or funding or policies really affect folks, not only at the federal level, but also at the state and local level as well, uh, which is a really great thing that we do. As Sharon mentioned, um, we really are generalists. We're from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, certainly the skill set specific to the Evans School is a great fit, but we have a wide range of academic experience across our agency and we have you know social workers statisticians history majors kind of you name it um, if you can research and you've got strong critical thinking skills there's there's probably a, a place for you at at gao um, I also just wanted to highlight we have a couple sort of structured programs that are really the types of opportunities that you'd be looking for as a graduate student. We have an internship program that we kind of have this on a, on a rolling basis. So right now, our agency is looking to start um, interviewing for the spring 2022 internships. Um, some of you may have applied for those jobs. and. Coming up next month, there should be an announcement for uh, the summer internships. And that's usually our largest internship pool uh, as well. So the most opportunities there for the past um, year and a half, all the internships have been virtual, which is kind of nice because in, in prior years, you know, there might be only a couple slots in the Seattle office. And we've always encouraged students, hey, if you're interested in a summer in DC, by all means, go apply. Um, spend a summer out there. It really is a great chance to kind of see, see how things operate um, at, at sort of the, you know, the federal level for a variety of reasons. But now there's also some benefits because as I said, we can be anywhere doing our work. And that's, I think for the foreseeable future, likely to still be the case. Um, we also have a structured, what we call our professional development program. And that's really our entry level analyst position um, that, as Sharon mentioned, offers an opportunity for new staff to rotate amongst teams. And so it gives you a chance to see how, for example, the, the defense capabilities and management team operates as well as the natural resources environment team. And so in addition to specific research topics, you're also getting a sense for the culture on a given team. And, you know, we have standard processes and quality assurance steps that we take across all of our work, but there is a little different feel and flavor um, to how the individual teams operate. So it's a really nice opportunity uh, for entry level staff to kind of get a, get a sense of of where sort of their individual interests, academic background might align with a particular issue area or, or mission team. And, you know, just generally a graduate student can expect to work on all aspects of a range of, of one of our engagements. Um, it can kind of look differently depending on where one is at during the scope of a review. Uh, typically our engagements take 
we'll say about a year. Um, I think an official range is probably more about, it could be eight or nine months, could be a year and a half, but really you're involved in every aspect of developing the scope and methodology of the work, um, consulting with a range of internal stakeholders, as we call them, um, that might be attorneys, statisticians, uh, research methodologists, um, subject matter experts on different teams with um, experience in areas that kind of overlap or intersect with the particular topic that you're reviewing. Um, we conduct interviews with federal officials, with academic experts, with industry uh, players across across sort of the realm of, of you know, commerce and industry that affects the specific topics we're looking at. And interns and new staff have the opportunity and are sort of expected to fully engage in all of these efforts. There's a, a wide number of supports and uh, a tremendous amount of training that goes along with both the internship and the professional development pr program. But really we consider uh, interns and new staffs to be full functioning members of the team. Um, so later in that work that could involve, you know, doing the drafting and writing of, of a report that ultimately is issued for Congress or having the chance to contribute to, to a testimony that someone like Sharon might be um, delivering on the Hill. So really a, a new staff can be involved in any and all parts of the engagement work here, um, which is a great chance to, you know, be able to contribute, to draw from your own personal experience and background and, and have a key role in the overall work that we do. And as I mentioned, there's a, one of the presentations, the Join Us presentation has a few more specifics on um, sort of how we're structured and organized. But I kind of wanted to shift gears a little bit at this point and give uh, some of my colleagues that have joined us here a chance to kind of share a little bit about their experiences um, and kind of structured around some questions you might be uh, thinking and, and sort of pondering yourself. Um, so we have Kareen, Sally, and Taylor here. I'm going to let them sort of share a little bit about their background when they've um, got, got responses to some of these questions here, but they have a range of experience across the agency, as well as strong ties to the University of Washington. Um, so the first question I, I thought I would pose to them is, you know, what type of work might a graduate student expect in a typical day at GAO? And I touched on some of those things, but, you know, from, from your experience, Taylor or Kareen, you know, what's, what's a day in the life look like uh, for you? You want me to start, Kareen? Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi. So I'm Taylor Bailey. I uh, graduated from the Evans School in um, summer of 2019. And I did my internship with GAO that spring of 2019 and then came back full time into the PDP program, um, the professional development program. There's a lot of acronyms at GAO, so I have to catch myself um, saying them, but uh, in August of 2019. Um, and so, yeah, I. Um, I guess I'll just say too, if anybody's interested in the specific mission teams, I have experience with the Homeland Security and Justice team, the Education, Workforce, and Income Security team, the Natural Resources and Environment team, and then the Defense team um, were the teams I had experience with through my internship and the PDP program rotations. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Maria did talk quite a bit about kind of the typical work you do at GAO in terms of um, interviews and, um, you know, data analysis and that sort of thing that you get to do on a day-to-day -day basis. But I would say kind of the, the bread and butter of what I do on a day-to-day -day is um, you, you would meet with your engagement team, which is anywhere from like three to, you know, five or six people on your team. Um, at least on a weekly basis, you're meeting and talking with your team, debriefing about what you're kind of working on, as well as sort of talking about those questions around the design of the engagement and the methodology and what kind of information you need to get. And, um, and then as you go along kind of in the process, you would start shifting more towards like talking about, um, you know, the types of things that you're finding and uh, messages that you might be able to talk about in, in the final report and that sort of thing. So lots of collaboration and meetings going on on a day-to-day -day basis with people in your team and stakeholders and that sorts of thing. Um, but then, yeah, it's in terms of the actual um, work, the engagement process is a lot like program evaluation, but it's 
I would say the main difference is there's a lot more documentation that happens because as auditors, we have to leave, you know, the audit trail and document every decision that we make. And so it's a lot of the same, you know, like design and research process as program evaluation, but um, I do do a lot of like documenting summaries of things that I've read or analyses that I've done, um, you know, thinking about data analysis and why we're going to analyze it the way we're going to analyze it and documenting those decisions and, um, you know, lots of summaries. And um, every time we do interview agency officials, we write up a summary of what we learned from that interview. So lots of um, writing up and coming up with questions, sets for what questions we're going to ask those agency officials and running those by the team. And so that's sort of some of the day-to-day -day work. And then I also just wanted to touch on real quick that, you know, when I typically look at my calendar for the week, it's full of a lot of um, really cool learning opportunities. That's GAO has a huge culture of, you know, enc encouraging people to just do whatever they're interested in and learn, you know, lots of different things, even if it doesn't necessarily relate specifically to the project you're working on. Um, like, for example, this morning, I went to two different presentations, one about um, uh, bias and data analysis, and then another one that was about artificial intelligence at the DOD. So, you know, there's a wide range of topics um, of different, you know, brown bag presentations and communities of practice and, you know, outside speakers coming in to do presentations for GAO, these things are happening throughout the week all the time. Um, and, you know, as an intern and as a PDP, I was really encouraged to participate in as many of those as I wanted to. And I, I really valued that highly in terms of my experience at GAO. Um, yeah, I'll pass it over to Corrine. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kareen Kionis. Uh, I'm a senior analyst on the healthcare team. Um, I've been at GAO for about um, three and a half years now. Um, I was a mid-career hire at GAO, so I'd worked um, for about 10 years in the federal government before joining GAO. Um, but I did work at UW. I did not graduate from UW, but I did work there, so I'm an alum of sorts. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... Um, I have a very similar experience to Taylor in that um, I came in through uh, the, the uh, professional development program and rotated through um, the physical infrastructure team, the Homeland Security and Justice team, and of course the healthcare team where I finally placed. Um, and, and since joining the healthcare team, um, most of my work has primarily been focused on the federal response to the pandemic. So a lot of really interesting, um, high profile, high impact work. Um, and, and, and it's been a really great opportunity to, to um, you know, feel like the day-to-day -day work that you're doing is making an impact on um, everybody's lives, including my family. Um, so that's been a really unique opportunity. Um, in terms of sort of the day-to-day -day work, I would definitely echo everything that Taylor has said about um, the various types of day-to-day -day engagement with the team um, and the various types of learning opportunities. I would say that um, at GAO, you know, you're primarily involved in doing, you know, three different things. You're primarily involved in collecting information, analyzing information, and trying to craft a story around that information. And so it's it's actually very similar to what you do, you know, day to day as a graduate student. Um, and I would say just in general, in terms of, you know, collecting that information, um, a lot of the skill sets that you have as a graduate student are very applicable to the work that we do here. Um, a lot of the time you're spending, you know, just doing research on the internet, looking at media reports, looking at scholarly literature on a particular topic. Um, as Maria had, and Taylor had mentioned, you do do a lot of engagement within the agency in terms of collecting information via interviews um, and information requests. But I would also say we ha also have the opportunity to occasionally do a site visit where we get to observe you know, in action um, what is happening with a particular program. And I would say pre-pandemic, I had the opportunity to um, uh, I was working on a job that looked at um, uh, cybersecurity at chemical facilities. So I actually had the opportunity to go to a chemical facility in Alabama and observe um, a cybersecurity officer review um, some of the procedures that they had in place. And I got to wear a hard hat and steel toe boots, so it was pretty cool. Um, but, um, you know, 
every once in a while you have a job that, that gives you that opportunity to get some hands-on um, in the field experience. Um, in terms of some of the analysis that we get to do at GAO, you know, it really does depend on a, what you're interested in, and also to the type of information that you've collected for your job. So for example, I've had the opportunity to analyze you know, financial or survey data and work with a methodologist um, to kind of identify key themes and, and you know, key topics um, that's coming out of that data. Um, a lot of what we do as well in terms of analysis is actually looking at how a program operates. And is it operating in the way in which it's supposed to, according to policy, according to regulations, um, and according to just in general best practices? And so a lot of the time we spend is collecting information about that and making the determination of is what's supposed to be working and what we're spending money on as a federal government, is it working the way that it should? And if it's not, what can what are some of the steps that an agency can take in order to help um, correct those actions and help a program operate in the way it's, that it's supposed to? So um, we do spend a lot of our time in sort of analysis, you know, trying to identify any sort of deficiencies, identifying some of those key policies, and getting perspectives from a variety of agency officials and stakeholders about what a program should look like. And um, and then in terms of that last bucket, sort of crafting that story, that's where we kind of pull everything together, right? Um, and we try and tell the story about what's happening with a particular program, how an agency is doing what it should, or perhaps maybe what it should not, and what are some key steps or recommendations that an agency can do to help um, make this program be more effective. That's, that's great. That's great, Karine. Thank you. Another question I think uh, a lot of us are interested in hearing more about is how is GAO thinking about racial equity and social social justice and, and how's the agency kind of bringing that into the work of the organization and so perhaps you can share a little bit on that Karine, and then pass it off to Sally. Yeah sure thanks Maria. Um, and so I would just say in general like GAO has a very holistic approach to um, diversity, equity, inclusion issues, DEI um, issues. Um, and, and that means, um, you know, everything from the actual audit work that we do and the topics that we focus on for our reports, as well as what we're doing internally as an agency um, with respect to our people values and how we're engaging kind of with our respective teams um, here at GAO. So I'm gonna speak more specifically to sort of the internal side. Um, and, uh, but I would say that um, first, I am part of the Seattle field offices, diversity, equity and inclusion efforts um, as part of our social and inclusiveness committee. And so basically what that means is we hold a variety of events and activities all designed to help, you know, bring our field office together and deal with the e &I topics as they relate to both the work that we do and what's going on just in general in the world. And so, for example, we have held um, community listening events where um, folks in the Seattle field office get together and talk about um, various um, events that are occurring um, out in the world, things like the George Floyd protests, or incidents of anti-Asian um, American violence, um, because the issues that are outside in the world affect us personally, and um, it's important to recognize that and um, how and think about how we bring sort of our authentic self um, to our jobs and to our work here at GAO. Another thing that we do in the Seattle field office, or at least we did prior to the pandemic, was um, we would hold a diversity potluck where everybody would, you know, bake a dish or make a dish and, and sort of bring it as an opportunity to kind of share their culture and her heritage with um, other folks in the Seattle field office. And so that was a really great, um, well attended event um, that's kind of, you know, building community and culture within the Seattle field office. Another initiative that I'm a part of is the Hispanic Liaison Group at GAO, which is one of GAO's employee um, resource groups or affinity groups that's primarily focused on issues related to the Hispanic and Latinx community. I serve as HLG's um, uh, field office representative um, here in Seattle. Uh, and what that means is I'm 
primarily just a sounding board for any issues that folks have in the Seattle field office and a sort of like a belly button for help them to connect with Hispanic liaison group activities um, and efforts that are ongoing um, GAO wide. And so for example, you know, we've been really active over the past month putting on some of our Hispanic Heritage Month events um, where we have speakers come in and, and talk to us about particular topics or issues like for example, GAO's recent report on Hispanics in the media. We're also heavily involved in some of GAO's recruitment efforts where we're looking to increase the, the, the pool of diverse applicants and in particular reach out to Hispanic serving institutions. And then finally, other efforts that HLG is involved in relate to the actual audit work that we do ourselves. And so one of the initiatives that we had been working on was to develop guidance um, for GAO uh, with respect to our immigration um, program portfolio. So a lot of the terminology um, around immigration perhaps isn't as people focused um, as it could be and not as inclusive as it could be, in part because um, some of the legal terminology associated with it. And so we have worked um, as an organization to help bring a little bit more of a more inclusive language into our immigration portfolio. So instead of using terms like alien, we would use terms like migrant um, and make sure that that's consistently applied across GAO's work. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Sally, stop talking. <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks, Corrine. Um, I'm Sally Williamson. Sorry, my screen just decided to blink out. Um, I'm Sally Williamson. I'm a senior analyst in our Defense Capabilities and Management, or DCM, team. Um, like Maria, I was in the Evans and Jackson programs. We had a lot of classes together, actually, um, and I graduated in 2007. Um, before that, I worked actually in magazine and book publishing, and I went to undergrad at Stanford, so I'm thankful that I don't really follow football. Um, because I guess something happened last weekend. But um, like everyone else, I've had the opportunity to rotate through several teams. Um, I've done some amazing travel through my work at GAO, so I'm happy to answer questions about that. Uh, and like Sharon, I've had both headquarters and now Seattle field office experience over the almost 14 years <laughs> that I've been at GAO. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about GAO's DE&I efforts, um, building on some of what Kareen said and what Sharon and Maria and um, Taylor have also said, um, both on the visibility and sort of like associational representation we have inside of GAO, but mostly focusing on um, more of the work we do and our contributions to the ongoing national dialogue, honestly, and programmatic attention of DEI issues. Um, as Sharon and Kareen kind of went over, GAO's had long had a lot of DEI and sort of people values types of efforts, uh, which I think speaks to you know GAO's organizational climate um, as well, particularly within the large um, federal government. Uh, they, we've always sort of had an eye in the last decade in particular um, with the development of our first um, diversity and inclusion strategic plan on recruiting and sustaining a diverse workforce. But I think like a lot of organizations, people, places, the last couple of years in particular have, I think, as Maria mentioned, kind of re-energized or re-emphasized um, discussions really both at the institutional level and at the day-to-day -day water cooler level at GAO about disparities, biases, the inherent and invisible kind of historic underpinnings of data analysis and structural analysis, honestly. Um, and so there's been an increasing amount of work, not only in what GAO has asked us to do, which as Sharon mentioned is how we get a lot of our work is either through congressional request letters or in mandates accompanying legislation, um, such as for appropriations acts and things like that. Um, but it's also been an increased awareness in like the practical application of DE&I in our work, even that's not focused on diversity issues, somewhat like Kareen was kind of mentioning. So I'm going to give a couple of my experiences in both of those regards, um, and then I'll turn it back to Maria to continue the discussion. And I'll keep my eye on time since I know where it's ticking away. Um, so just for me personally, um, I work in a defense area, in the defense area, a lot of my work is focused on the military service members in general, or defense organizations um, 
doing other work as well. So I think there's a lot of probably assumptions that come along with that. Um, but, you know, recent work I've been involved in has really included raising the consciousness of the importance of the words we use in our reports, like Kareen mentioned, um, to, def to reflect the diverse workforce, program recipients, um, etc. So a, an example that I'll just give you very practically similar to Kareen's is a Navy maintenance job I worked on a couple um, years ago, you know, in a lot of DOD terminology, um, it's very gendered. So things like manning are actually what they use to describe the people, you know, basically a portion to a given activity. And so there were some grassroots efforts really um, on the part of several teams, like Kareen mentioned, but including Maria's team and others, um, to encourage using gender neutral terms like staffing or personnel resources um, or other sort of non gendered or people focused terms. Um, that's resulted in institutional guidance, like Kareen mentioned, for GAO style writ large across all of our reports to incorporate gender neutral and inclusive terms and people first terminology, but also ensuring that kind of a DEI lens, you know, is applied to our work overall, um, which, you know, seems like a no brainer, but is kind of radical in terms of the slow moving bureaucratic wheels of, you know, the federal government. Um, it's, you know, and it's, it's a dicey political and cultural area to adjust in. So I think as GAO with our nonpartisan objective, you know, independent approach has to be very mindful of. Um, but I think GAO's done a really good job of doing just that. In fact, a personal anecdote is the uh, my boss, the director on that Navy job I mentioned, was the first transgender woman ever to testify before Congress on behalf of her agency. And I think that's pretty amazing and radical that we have a you know trans woman that's leading a lot of DOD focused work. And I think that speaks to kind of, you know, the the industry leadership really that GAO has in the federal government to some extent. Um, specifically in terms of diversity oriented work that we do. I think everybody's mentioned that that's increased a lot in recent years, given the, you know, uh, attention and concern on all partisan sides about the various related issues. Um, so, you know, we have to be mindful, like I said, of being nonpartisan and independent um, and kind of agnostic, but aware of all the political drivers behind that. But I think that honest broker approach has really allowed us to bring powerful messages to the fore of congressional work and discourse. Um, a couple of recent reports that have come out of both our defense team and other teams include um, looking at racial disparities in the military justice system that spawned, I think, two or four testimonies and you know was widely covered in the news. Um, another team that looks at education and workforce and income security called EWIS, if you look at our website, they recently issued a report on gender pay gap, the gender pay gap for federal workers um, that looks a lot at promotion data and kind of the lack of, you know, while, while gender pay gap is narrowed, it's still very much there. Um, we've had teams look at diversity in the private sector as well, including in the tech and financial industry. And I'm leading a job right now actually with Taylor, um, looking at diversity across the DOD civilian workforce, which you know, the DOD civilian workforce makes up the largest population of federal workers, aside from the military itself. Um, it's the largest employer in the world, aside from the People's Republic of China. And, you know, it, so we can play a real role in helping shape the federal government's approaches in this area and advance its understanding and application of the issues in a variety of programs. Um, the last thing I'll say is if you're interested in understanding more about um, GAO's work on racial justice, racial disparities, and other issues. Uh, we have kind of a featured topic on our website. Um, you can just go to gao.gov slash race hyphen America, and it will really give a good kind of overview of a lot of the different areas that we've done work like this in. So um, yeah, thanks for having us, and I'll turn it back to Maria. Thanks so much, Sally. And yeah, I had dropped a link to the Race in America um into the chat pod so you can take a look at that i know we've just got a little more time here so perhaps real briefly i'll talk a little bit about upcoming um upcoming vacancy announcements and opportunities for applications and then we can get back to open q a, q &A and maybe give um Sally and Kareen and Taylor, a couple more chances to share from their experiences. But just to let you know, we don't always have a huge amount of advanced time as 
you know, heads up in terms of when and where the exact vacancy announcements will be um, posted. We do know rough time frames, and so like I said, in December, we do expect there will be the summer internship announcement out, and I always do my best to share that as soon as I get the word with Shannon um, and Carolyn so she can help push that information out to you. But really, the biggest tip is to sign up on USA Jobs ahead of time. You can be notified anytime there's a new GAO position available there. You know, we do, in addition to having the internships and the general professional development program, there are additional opportunities um, for those with more specialized backgrounds to apply for positions as well. So you can really make sure that you've got an eye to anything you might have particular expertise or interest in there. And I did a couple of the tip sheets that I sent as well, give some pointers, the USA job system can be uh, challenging to navigate. And so I think those tip sheets really help kind of direct you um, to sort of uh, factors for success there. But overall, I think, you know, as you complete your application, really focusing on your critical thinking skills, thinking about experience, experience you have with both qualitative and quantitative data analysis, your ability to communicate complex information and distill it down to key messages and themes, right? That's really kind of the core of our work and to the extent that you can draw from either prior work experience or your experience at the University of Washington on projects or research related to that, I think that really helps um, put together a, a strong application there. Um, and you can also just so you know, you can populate the resume section on USA Jobs in advance so that when the announcements are posted, then you're just completing um, the narrative portion and the, the information specific to the GAO announcement and that can save a little bit of time as well. Um, all right, well, I'd love to open it up for Q&A. Um, certainly though, I, maybe as we do that or as part of that, maybe um, Taylor and Sally can share just a couple examples of ways in which GAO has adapted or not or shifted in sort of the, the all virtual environment and sort of talk to your experience there real quick. And then certainly any Q&A that anyone has, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Sure, I can jump in really quick and I'll, I'll you, please feel free to interrupt me, anyone with questions that are more interesting than what I'm about to talk about, which is the virtual environment we've all suffered through in the last year and a half. Um, I think, you know, GAO, lucky for all of us um, that work here, was really well positioned to transition to a virtual environment. I mean, we have technical issues like everybody. We've been through our number of collaborative platforms like everybody. Um, there's certainly no shortage of headaches, but I would say we, we had a pretty robust telework work from home um, program that we had. And so it was easier, I think, than especially in the federal world, for, much easier for us um, than it was for a lot of other federal agencies to transition to at-home working because a lot of us already had experience doing that. Some people were already doing that in an extended fashion. Um, so it, it wasn't as hard as I think it was for a lot of agencies from which friends I have, you know, I've heard horror stories of like not having computers, not even having a laptop, like kind of, you know, it made a stressful situation even more so. Um, I think too, you know, Taylor and I can speak to some degree of while we've been lucky to work in the office the majority of our time before the pandemic, um, our teammates, because we are actually working together right now, um, we've had two intern colleagues and a PDP colleague, all of whom have never stepped foot in a GAO office before, which is kind of insane for me to think about. Um, so that has presented some challenges just because like anything, there's assumptions you have based on interpersonal interactions that don't always translate to an entirely virtual um, environment. That said, I think, you know, as somebody who's been both in the headquarters environment and the field environment, being in a field office, whether or not you're in the office itself, felt a lot more virtual. It was more virtual than I think headquarters folks. I think headquarters, just like probably for the rest of the federal government, the kind of inside the beltway thinking, which is what we refer to, you know, being in the beltway of I-95 or if we had, um, in uh, the DC area, like there, you know, there's just like a less, less of a familiarity of kind of the rest of the country, so to speak. So we kind of have always had that um, bifurcation working outside of the beltway. Um, and I think for headquarters, it's been a little bit more um, of a real transition. But uh, that's, I mean, it's been, you know, it, it's 
I think it's a testament to GAO's flexibility and nimbleness that we've been able to really do most of our work. I mean, I was on a job where we were supposed to go look at aircraft carriers and, you know, walk around on aircraft carriers and in shipyards. And we basically converted that to virtual site visits and individuals of us like split up where we live and someone lived in, you know, the DC area. So drove down to Norfolk and used our federal IDs to walk around the shipyard down there by themselves and just sort of like check out the things we wanted to check out. And my teammate and I separately drove up to the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton and did the same thing. And it wasn't the same, but it kind of, you know, we made it work and we had issued the report and we worked with people and it was very much like it was before. So um, I hope we go back to doing more travel and I hope we do a lot more of our traditional work, but I think it's been a really great experiment to do it this way. And it opens up possibilities that I think as the future of work is debated by all um, will be debated by GAO as well. So Taylor. Yeah, I'll just note too on that same um, line of thought is that prior to the pandemic, a lot of times, um, since we are so dispersed across the country, your like engagement team, the project you're working on is often not with people in your field office. A lot of times you're working with folks in the Denver office and the Dallas office and headquarters. And so um, even before we all started working from home, a lot of my meetings, depending on the composition of my team, were all virtual anyways, because we were spread across the country. Um, so that's a lot in a lot of ways, like our work didn't change in that respect either. Um, obviously, you know, the feeling of like commuting and going to the office and all of that's gone, but like the day to day work at GIO, I don't feel like has changed really at all. Um, and then, yeah, I've been a buddy to several interns who've done the fully intern or the fully virtual internship program at GAO. And um, I'll just say there is an overabundance of opportunity to network with people that they're providing during the internship program. Um, you know, there's times, I know they have like scheduled meetings throughout the weeks to network with your team that your mission team that you're on, other interns, PD peers, um, directors of different teams. Everybody is really approachable and open to setting up a quick, you know, 30 minute Zoom meeting to get to know you. and. Um, so you can learn as much about the people at GAO um, that you can in your in your 10 weeks or whatever it is during the internship. So, um, and we also have almost every mission team started a mixing bowl initiative during the pandemic where, you know, you're just randomly paired up with other people from your mission team and you have a, you know, 30 to hour long, 30 minutes to hour long Zoom chat and just get to know people on the team. So they're doing their best to, you know, I guess, create intentional ways to connect, um, even if it is through a screen, which isn't the same, yeah. but um, yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Taylor. And there's a question here in the in the chat pod. Um, Sharon mentioned being a generalist. Are there opportunities for people who have specific interest areas? Um, and and yeah, you know, as a as a PDP, as I mentioned, there's sort of three, you typically rotate across three different um, mission teams and you don't always have a say in what the first one is that has a lot to do with our overall agency workload and resources and what projects are being staffed um, but then once you're kind of in there's certainly an opportunity to express you know interest in a general issue area and and then over the years you really can sort of you know build up some subject matter expertise and uh, we absolutely encourage generalists but as as the years go on um, I, many of us really have kind of found our ways to to specific topics um, or general sort of areas that, that that we feel we've got particular expertise in and can contribute to there. And also, I will say you might also end up on a project that you unexpectedly become really interested in. Um, I went to the Jackson School. I had thought I would be maybe on Homeland Security, which was the closest team that Seattle had to the international affairs um, team, but started working on some aviation flight delay engagement during my rotation with the physical infrastructure team and just love the team culture. I found I really just enjoyed learning. Um, and so sort of my, my interests sort of shifted over time as well. So you can kind of get a little bit of both. Any other questions? Oh, Maria, I was just going to jump in too yeah. and, and just let folks know, because I mean, in the healthcare team, we actually hire both folks that are coming through the PDP Among program that are more generalists, but we also hire specifically directly into the healthcare team. And usually those listings for those positions go out at the same time as the listing for the generalists. So 
Um, in the healthcare team, we have people that um, have MPHs or PhD in different kinds of healthcare areas. And we have like healthcare nurse consultants that we work with. So there are some opportunities to get hired directly into teams. And then I think Maria said this too, you can also, I think on the application, you can say your interests or preferences for topics, but we can't guarantee that you necessarily will get to rotate through them. Thanks, that's, that's a great example, Sharon. And then I do wanna highlight one last question in the chat um, from Aaron before we sign off for the day. How do you navigate working for a nonpartisan agency with your own personal beliefs and values? You take that, Maria, or at least start it. <laughs> sure, I'll start it. I mean, I think one key part of the work is we really focus a lot up front when there's a particular request that comes in or something, um, a mandate that's written into law. One of our first steps is, you know, doing additional background work and really thinking about how we can develop a uh, you know, an objective scope and methodology. And we all, I mean, we're human beings. We all have our particular viewpoints and perspectives, but it really comes down to, you know, what is a, an unbiased way to assess this problem and really thinking about it as a research project, um, taking in a variety of perspectives and, and having balance there. And so it's, it's not that we don't talk about how we think and feel about certain issues, um, but we try to bring that, you know, from a methodological perspective to make sure we've got a, a, a lens to, are we covering all these topics? What are some other considerations that maybe the congressional committee that put in the request isn't thinking about when they've asked us to look to a sp specific topic, but that we, through our work, can highlight and kind of put a spotlight on. Um, but Sharon, perhaps you have... Yeah, they, I, that's perfect. And the other thing I was going to add is that we do have through the different kind of milestones that we do with our project management, we do have uh, staff declare their independence. We also have like through the managers, myself as a director, annually we do um, a review of disclosures from staff. Um, like if they have work outside of GAO, where their money is, <laughs> you know. So we have like a lot of like uh, different tools in place to make sure that uh, people are coming in with the intent to be independent and, and objective. There's a lot of checks and balances that we put in place with our, our, our project management tools. Well, I do want to be mindful of time of and we are at the end of the hour. So thank you so much to everyone who joined from the GAO. Thanks to all of the students who joined us. And um, I am able to keep this Zoom room open for a little bit longer. So if there are any additional